Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. We thought that we would drill down today on one of probably the most sought after python species of the last 25 years, uh, the black-headed python, Aspidites melanocephalus. Um, so like a bit of background on these, the allure that they hold for a lot of people. See nowadays, a lot of the noobs and people that are into the fashion of the hobby are waiting for the world's first on royals or even worse world's first on retics and some of the gloss or shine of some of the most sought after species um, has maybe been lost or you don't quite understand the significance of species like this um, I've been keeping 27 years it's hard well 27 years this year it's hard to believe because I'm so gorgeous but I have and this and its cousin the, the uh, Ramses python or Woma python uh, were basically the, the most sought after the golden goose the, the, the snake that everybody wanted these sort of mythical Australian awesome species um, you know absolutely amazing snakes and th they were almost impossible to get some found their way into zoo collections no doubt were reproduced and then eventually uh, with the european zoos probably got released into captive hands and, and uh, you know breedings taking place obviously there are some that have occurred through uh, more nefarious means um but eventually they made their way over here and i remember paul who, who, who works here with me at snakes now does he this will have been about 99 maybe 2000 went and bought um two pairs of black-headed pythons uh from europe and i think he parted with over ten thousand pounds for two pairs so if that puts into perspective the value that these animals had and prior to that even more I mean we're talking ridiculous sums of money and this wasn't for an albino or a granite or a sunglow or a tiger or any of this other crap they were just rare species that people wanted to keep and the reason they wanted to keep them was well just look at them they're absolutely stunning this guy looks like it's had its head dipped in a bucket of tar it's just so cool the way it contrasts and then obviously with these this back banding just amazing snakes now these will grow to be good sized snakes a female will hit well she recorded to hit upwards of about three meters 10 feet 11 feet in length in captivity it's usually smaller than that about eight or nine feet but the weights of females is incredibly impressive big girls can weigh as much as 14 15 kilos and they bark or even less that some females was reaching 16 kilos in weight which is huge you know think of the biggest common bow you see and you're just about getting there so it's hard to believe that these snakes have got that sort of build you know that these when people had diversified collections and were still keeping cool stuff not just 30 examples of the same thing these were the top these green trees emerald tree boas these were the top, these and Womas, and of the two, the blackheads were the harder species to get. They can be a pain in the arse to incubate the eggs. Um, the breeding isn't so much of an issue, but getting the eggs to hatch is a royal pain in the ass, which is what precluded them from a lot of people. Once the animals are established in feeding, actually, they're so easy. They, you could sell them as a, a beginner animal if it wasn't for the size that they got to, because they don't require any extra humidity. Uh, they're incredibly hardy tolerate high temperatures feed like trains once they're established you just can't get enough down them so we'll do a bit more background about them so the tight locality oddly is uh, Bowen in Queensland even though predominantly the animals that we see in captivity would have occurred in the Northern Territory which would be Darwin uh, and west of there which is the Kimberley as well so we would be dealing with slightly more arid animals than say the Bowen Queensland locality because this animal's got a huge range far wider than people realize and on the distribution maps drawn up by Barker and Barker in pythons in the world Australia they range right over from Pilbara in the west up through the Northern Territory and right across into Queensland including Cape York which is the rainforest 
So, you know, these animals really are quite diverse and varied. Uh, there is, there was some consternation as to whether there was two separate types. Um, I still know them just all as Aspidites melanocephalus. No doubt some body will come on, there'll have been papers proposed, but the Pilbara and open desert regions uh, precluded the animals from crossing. And it's been suggested the Pilbara regions, which are noted to be slightly smaller, uh, may be a, a, a disjunct subspecies of this. Uh, but we'll not get too bogged down in that. I'm sure somebody will write in the comments. Um, so what we'll also discuss is uh, their natural habits. They are adept burrowers. They will live in the burrows of goannas, monitor lizards as we know them, uh, and also mammals. Uh, they spend a lot of time underground. They're from relatively harsh environments, which would have very high daytime temperatures, which are unsustainable long term. So they, they would come out of the heat of the day. But these animals can bask at high temperatures with females, particularly pregnant ones, being noted to bask in temperatures in excess of 40 degrees Celsius, which for a python is incredibly high. And there's not many species that we would discuss those sorts of temperatures with. Um, so also diet. These are reptile specialists. This is the python version of a king snake or milk snake. These, these, these guys love their reptiles. And Shine, uh, an author in 1991, said that the um, stomach washers of the wild blackheads actually only contained 10% mammals. 90% were reptilian. That's impressive. They are known as being what we call a theophagic or cannibals or snake eaters. And at which point that's not supported either um, in, in the numbers uh, Predominantly, the diet is made up of blue tongue skinks, western bearded dragons, frilled dragons, and uh, what was the other one? S spiny tail monitors. That's it. So that's that's their diet. That's the 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 four main species that they would collect in captivity. They are far easier going. Uh, with their food and will feed on mice and rats quite happily exceptionally sized females may tolerate being fed on rabbits uh, but larger prey can sometimes be regurgitated it upsets their stomach so you may be safe for feeding multiple prey items of a smaller size so that would be my advice there they have got a relatively small head so going mad with the size and girth of prey could actually be a recipe for disaster if they normally would feed on animals that have got relatively small legs relatively small hip girdles do we really need to be feeding them monster mammals as their diet not not really no um, Throughout the years in the zoological institutions, they've experimented with feeding the mother mammals. They've been known to accept Burmese pythons, boa constrictors, uh, western spiny lizards. So they'll take a range of things uh, and the spiny tailed iguanas they've took as well. Um, but obviously we're not going to be doing that in captivity. It's far easier when we've got uh, lab raised rats and mice that we would use those. Um, so in the northern hemisphere, they copulate between December and March. Eggs are between March and June. Uh, the pre-egg laying shed was noted by Barker to occur 14 days before oviposition. Um, incubation, as I've already mentioned, is a pain in the ass. Um, loads of eggs failed when they were first trying to breed these, and that was um, essentially marked down to get it, marked down to um, people putting making the incubation media too moist, and uh, that uh, the uh, we, we would need to manipulate the temperature at the end of the incubation session so maybe 10 14 days before the eggs are due to hatch you know we might need to manipulate those temperatures slightly to get them to hatch out i've never bred this species myself so i'm not going to discuss that with you in detail but these are just some of the notes that i've been reading so i mean as far as temperament goes as you can see good as go a personable tame tractable we're not aggressive, we're not whipping around, they're very, very settled species, fabulous to keep. A full-grown black-headed python female is incredibly impressive. Um, they retain their colours, they don't really mucky out that much, which is great. So we get these colours all the way through their life. Their heads are super uh, high gloss, so just really impressive species. When we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of royals out there and thousands and thousands of retics out there do not lose sight of the fact that we have got super cool species that we can keep 
that are still rare, that will still always have a market, that isn't going to crash anytime soon, that people will still rack their brains and challenge themselves trying to get these animals to hatch out. And it's the investment in species like this that means that we keep the diversity moving forwards. The black-headed python is a super species. Awesome. And for people like me, 25 years plus in standing, they're the pinnacle of pythons. This is it. This is as good as it gets. They are ace. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, if you've only been doing it a few years, then the morph market is still very high on your agenda. But forget about it, man. These, these are where it's at. Plus, they're now producing exanthics, which are the black and greys, and then there's albinos, there's all sorts of stuff going on. But why faff with something that's almost perfect anyway? These things are awesome just as they are. So, yeah, definitely have a look into them. The Latin name is Aspidites melanocephalus. Visit the website, which is www.snakesandadders.co.uk to see what we're all about. And we'll try and keep the videos coming. Cheers, guys.